Hey, scholars. Uh, let's talk about Mexican independence from Spain for our California history. And it's a, from a California perspective. And uh, background to this, the big picture of this is that uh, so much of California history is written from the perspective of the United States of America, which is the North, you know, it's the East Coast stuff, Constitution, Declaration of Independence, and the sort of trajectory of that political system coming westward. We are committed to the idea that California is a regional place, and so as a regional history, we don't, you know, we look at chronologically where we come from and with the different governments, the different ideals that are coming here. And so we were actually a northward migration, and we are Mexicans. We are Spaniards, and then the, uh, the Mexican form of Spaniard that created out here into, the, uh, into this side of the um, Spanish Empire. Very interesting, all sorts of ideals uh, in the 16, 1540s and around 1600, you know, and settlement of Santa Fe, all sorts of things that are, we're, we're all tied in with some high idealism to create, uh, do the Spanish Empire well out here in what is the last sort of corner vestige uh, of their empire. A lot of bad things had happened all over the place and really with California, they were trying to do better uh, for the most part. And then with the uh, end of the Spanish empire, the Spanish king is pushed out of Mexico and Mexico gains its independence as part of a whole series of uh, Latin American Mex independence movements against Spain. And, and so so let's, uh, let's talk about that and see how a new regime, which is the United States of Mexico, the United Mexican States, however you want to translate it, it is um, a new idea of, of how to run California. And they're very proud of it. And we should be very proud of it. We were part of a Mexican idealism. And, uh, and so that is what I want to talk about today. Uh, so much of California history, as you read it in the textbooks and the newspapers and stuff, turns dark. It turns cynical. It turns, uh, I don't know why it is, but there's this tendency toward, toward uh, trying to undermine the values by saying, look, it didn't happen. And in our class, we're always, let's, let's look at the ideals and look at those aspirations and look at the attempts to make it work. Of course they don't work. <laughs> yeah, of course they don't work. We're all flawed. We're all human. But the thing is, is that what, what sort of pushes history, it's my belief, what really pushes history is not those uh, horrible things that happen because horrible things that happen are going to happen because we're basically horrible people. Uh, but on the other hand is when we do our best, when we are interested in flourishing and, and, and getting beyond the, the sort of flaws that we have, that's when we're at our best, and that's when nations are at their best, and, and we want to sort of always keep that in mind. We want, we, yeah, follow the flaws, but at the same time, keep the big ideas in mind. What, what's the greatness of Martin Luther King Jr., but the fact that he points to, I have a dream, he points to the Declaration of Independence, he points to the America, this is what you said, this is what you want. It doesn't matter so much that, in my mind, that Thomas Jefferson was a hypocrite, he was. But on the other hand, he articulated in beautiful language, ideals which have ingrained themselves in the United States of America. We need to understand that for Mexico and understand it. there's a great pride in being Mexican. And we were for a while Mexican, you know, and, uh, and take pride in that and at the same time, uh, this Mexican heritage that uh, is here in California that gets overrun by the United States of America. The United States of Mexico uh, gets pushed out. And uh, that's not necessarily a good thing. And it's certainly not a good thing for the Indians. And that's what we're sort of emphasizing today. Remember the classical value uh, that has been, you know, deep, deep tradition of how do you judge a government, whether it's good or bad? You judge it on how it treats the least of its members, the weak. Do the rich take care of the poor? Do the strong take care of the weak? Do the healthy take care of the sick? And that, by that judgment, Indians being the weakest, 
We want to always keep an eye on them and they will lose out to the United States of America. But watch carefully how we talk about it today and I'll read to you documents about how Mexico was very conscientiously trying to eat, treat the Indians of California well. Okay, so basic start, a lot of revolutions. These revolutions happen, they tend to happen in the 1820s. You see here's 1820. 21, here's 1819, 23. They, they begin around 1810, and lots of feistiness and lots of things going on. And then by 1820, Spain has really lost control of Latin America. Uh, Greece also comes about in 1820. 1820, a lot of stuff going on in 1820. And then there's a lot of stuff going on in 1848, a little later on. All of this sort of independence movements that create the modern world. So California's going to be part of that. In Mexico, uh, the initial leadership is, is uh, by uh, this priest named Hidalgo and then Morales. And, and they, you know, they put out a, a Declaration of Independence document. They get squashed. They get squashed in all sorts of politics. So we're going to talk about the Mexican Revolution goes on for a while and dies down and comes back. And it comes back hard. And uh, the leadership that had actually helped squash the earlier guys come back. And they then go against Spain. And we do get a, uh, in 1821, you know, uh, there's a ending of the War of Independence. You have this plan of Iguala and the Treaty of Cordoba, a constitutional monarchy. This is what England has. They are going to actually send over to Europe to find a, a person who will be named king. But the parliament, a parliamentary house of lords, house of commons type of situation will will rule in Mexico with most power. Uh, they were going to have social and racial equality, no slavery. You know, this is a great goal. This is the Enlightenment. They, they want to do this actually better than the United States then, because, of course, the United States Constitution kept slavery and instituted it with the three sucks clause and things like that. They have very high ideals of doing government correctly. And so they really believe that Christianity and the Roman Catholic Church has to be the foundation of their government. And so just as uh, in the way the United States had, of America had gone into a type of you know, dispersion for a lot of reasons, you take my American history class, we've talked about these sort of things, into you know, uh, uh, what becomes a separation of church and state. They had no separation of church and state in the sense that the Roman Catholic Church was there. They wanted, you wanted to buy land, you wanted to be married here, you wanted, you wanted to be a fully participating citizen of the state, you should be in the a Roman Catholic, okay? The, and they, remember, this shows high idealism. This shows they can't just like wallow into a, into a, a, a not irreligion or, or sort of vague religion. They want strong religion and especially no slavery. They want racial equality. Social equality, racial equality when it comes to politics. Equal before the law. Okay? So, Iturbide is one of these typical, very flawed individuals. While they're off uh, looking for someone to come in and get this constitutional monarchy set up, he then wants more power, grabs power, becomes an emperor figure. He eventually gets himself killed. So, 1824 is what you need to think about. 18, this is all precursor to to what's really important. 1824 comes along, and the people who got rid of Iturbide, which is Santa Ana, and this guy here, Guadalupe Victoria, he is gonna become the first president of the United States of Mexico, the United Mexican States, okay? And uh, he is gonna be a man of high ideals. He is gonna be the guy who is in charge of Mexico and gets things started for California, and that's what we want to talk about, all right? Now, okay, so we got Guadalupe uh, Victoria as the president, and they have it in their constitution of 1824, a setup in which they have states, like the United States, you know, we have states, United States of Mexico, but then the places that don't have enough population are territories, and so, you can see California here is a territory. Baja is a territory, you know. And so with the being a territory, you have a different type of government, much like Puerto Rico is territory to us, Guam. Uh, uh, you know, there's, there's uh, 
what are those? Those are other islands. There's, there's different territories. And then, you know, back in the day, you know, Indiana was a territory and stuff like that before it became a state. And in the system, you get a territorial governor. So, so the jefe politico, the, the head chief political officer, is sent up from the capital in Mexico City. And then, being a, this new republic, you're going to have your own Republican uh, system. And so the way it works for California, okay, is that we have a governor sent to us, okay, and there's going to be two governors that you want to remember. The one that we're going to talk about today is Echendia, and then the next one is Figueroa. Both of them high-minded governors, do, and uh, Figueroa especially is going to do great. But, um, uh, you know, the, we, these are good governors, okay, we're not looking at bad uh, bad actions uh, necessarily. And then there's going to be local folks here which create a deputacion, sort of deputies, okay? And there's seven members. Now this is one from each presidio, there's four presidios, and then the three pueblos, which is Santa Cruz, Los Angeles, and San Jose. But this is going to grow because the pueblos is going to grow. The, as we'll see, the plan is for colonization to be established and then there's going to be Indian Pueblos, there's going to be new foreigner Pueblos, there's going to be more and more Pueblos. That's, that's the goal. So the Diputacion is going to grow. And then the Pueblos are going to have self-government among themselves. You're going to have like a mayor figure, uh, I'll call that. You have a city council type of thing. So you're going to have layers of government uh, in which essentially the great ideal of Republican government is popular sovereignty, that the people have a voice. Okay, it's not that it's completely democratic, but the people are there and able to look after their rights, their natural rights. So this is a good system, and the question is how to handle the missions and what to do with them. And so that's what I want to talk to you now about, all right, is is that uh, there was this junta, which is a group. Victoria calls for this junta de fomento, which is de Californianos. The, the, I don't speak Spanish, so I don't know how to form it. But the thing is, is that it's, a, it's a, for the formation of the Californians under this new Republican system. And uh, this is, I'm going to give you a translation here. We're going to read from a translation of it. But this is right from the start, Mexico City wants to make this happen up in, up in uh, where we are, you know. You get a, I've read a lot of California history, and, and it's always sad to me when there's this type of portrayal of after the Spaniards have left, there's this belief that the Mexicans aren't concerned about us, the Mexicans aren't doing anything up here, and so we become independent, we become this sort of island, and they use the term Californios, we become these sort of like Cal island of Californios. And then what that does mentally is set you up to be ripe to be quashed by the United States. Uh, if you take that back and sort of rethink it, there's uh, in many ways, uh, especially with Echendia and then later with the, uh, Figueroa, colonization is a project. They're working at it. It's taking time. It's, but it's gonna happen and, and things are working, okay? Um, so uh, don't fall into the trap that, uh, that Mexico just didn't care about us or didn't know we were going on up there. They're, you know, I'm not trying to create an idealistic system that everything worked well, but I just don't want you to fall into the trap of thinking that, that uh, you know, the United States of America had sort of a right to come take this wallowing place, California, that had nothing going on here. We had a lot going on here, and we were on a project, a project to do a type of government which I think you can argue is better than the United States of America, this 1824 Constitution, if it works out correctly. Okay, so the, uh, um, let me get over to this. And uh, so you have this, this is the document in translation here. And I want to show you just some parts of it, okay? Uh, this is the language of it. Uh, if then he is to act in a manner which is the efficient and fruitful of the results, and he's talking about the, the jefe politico, the chief 
officer they're going to send up there, the new governor. It's sort of orders to the new governor. The new chief of California needs to, the most positive instructions to direct him. You know, this, this is a document to dis- direct him in positive ways. While a beneficent and wise law drastically reforms the system set up by the Spanish. So it's going to be a beneficent and wise set of laws that the Mexicans want to create under President uh, Victoria to develop California. Okay? Um, So uh, therefore, uh, the junta, this group writing the document, believes it very important that the chief shall take into account that the mass of the population of California is heterogeneous. There's lots of different people here. And it's composed, and he talks about these different parts of the, the population. And then with respect to the Indians, the neophytes, the Christian Indians, and the catechumens, who are, one might say, at the door of society. The Spanish had, had all these Indians living in the missions, and what are we going to do with them? They're like at the door of society. They are ready to become uh, part of the civilized system of uh, you know, the, their government. It will be necessary for them to fit themselves into the mission system until a more suitable one is established. So we're going to go slow. This is going to be a big issue. How fast do we secularize the missions? Everybody is ready to secularize the missions and do right by the Indians. How fast that happens. That's uh, that's a big issue. And then the key to the whole thing is is that you're going to have these Indians and you're going to permit the establishment of nearby settlements for the converts. The missions control the land, it says. And so we're going to divide up the missions. And who's going to get that mission land? The converts. Not all of it, but the, but the vast majority of it. You're, we are going to set up settlements of the Indian converts, the neophytes, those, those Indians that had been part of the mission. Okay. Um, so we're here on the dis- distribution of land. Now, I wanted to point out this. Keep going here in the documents. You can see the documents fairly elaborate. These guys have thought these things through and done their research. Um, Okay, it should not be forgotten. This is very important. We'll see this with uh, Figueroa carries this way through too. Uh, It should not be forgotten that the missions which have completely occupied the whole land, you know, they basically sort of have these huge land claims, were founded and took possession before the conversion and subjugation of the heathen under the harsh law of discovery. They're recognizing this, you know, that the Spanish did, it was a harsh law that took over this place, but the, and the Indians were there already. So the cross and the flag were planted at the same time, nor should be forgotten, and the missions have chosen for their sites the villages of the heathen. So the heathen were living, the Indians were living where the missions were set up. The very places uh, experienced masters has selected land because of convenience. Neither should be forgotten that the Calvary heathen have not known the law of ownership of property. The Indians beforehand didn't know they owned the land, but we conquered, Spanish conquered them in a harsh process, but Spanish law now recognizes, Mexican law now recognizes that the Indians, even though they didn't have a law of ownership of their land, do now own their land, okay? according to the principles of the nations, cannot for this reason been denied the right to have the soil which they were born. And it should be first an inescapable step towards civilizing them to give them to understand and recommend to them the value of that land and this spirit, the Christian Indians themselves, the old Christians, the neophytes, the catechisms should see themselves favored in the distribution of land. This document, you know, it says, okay, these these Indians didn't have a legal system to declare ownership of the land. However, because of our system, we're going to recognize that they did own the land that they were sitting on. Missions came in. Now, as those mission lands get distributed about, these Indians are going to get that land. Okay, they are not some 
And later on, uh, Figueroa is going to fight that their Indians are proprietors of their land. They're not colonists, and so they, they get more land. They get, they get favored, okay? They get favored. So we're going to give favoritism to these Indians so that they get started up correctly, creating more Pueblos, and then these Pueblos would be part of the system of, of government in um, uh, Mexico. Contemplate it. Think about it. You have probably heard fourth grade California history. So much. California history just, you know, it just saddens me how, uh, how harshly it is taught. And so often you hear that the Indians were just, you know, removed from their land. And there is great truth to this, and, but you have to be subtle and careful with it. But it, the Mexican government, when it was here, in its first documents, very conscientiously was trying to say, this is Indian land. We are going to fulfill that promise that the Spanish made a long ago, that this is, a, we're not kicking the Indians out. We are making citizens of them part of this, this grand idea of a, a, of a civic fellowship. Now, the United States is going to come in, and, the, and during martial law, talk about this later, but during uh, the period of martial law, before we become a state, after the gold rush, is the General Mason declares that Indians do not own land. So the United States walks in and says, Indians don't own any land. That's a huge, huge difference. The United States brings in slavery. The United States takes away Indian land. Uh, California is racked by this, and I, I will t deal with the American thing. And, and uh, America is gonna, United States is gonna do uh, uh, do a lot of good here and stuff like that. I'm, I'm not trying to bash the United States, but I am trying to uplift Mexico. I think we need to recognize that not only do we steal the land from Mexico, we also really screwed up the system. Okay, Mexico was in working toward this kind of stuff. Alvarado, uh, who's a later government, sort of, Pio, Pio Pico, you know, we, we get some bad things happening, but if the trajectory had kept going and the documents kept standing, like this one does, um, Indians would have been better off. Okay, so uh, let's go back here and finish off. And uh, yeah, this is that. All right, so this is the guy who sent up to California. His name's Echendia. Like I said, Echendia or Figueroa are two governors you should remember. Echendia is sent here. Uh, he's governor for, a, you see, a, a fair long stretch here. And then one year he's out. And then a fair, you know, this, these two years here. And then you see Governor Figueroa is going to come in. And he's got to deal with a lot of problems. Uh, feisty population, all sorts of stuff. And... Um, our goal, our, what you should know, is, is that he is trying to do a good job, okay? Uh, he's, he is, uh, um, he's not a selfish person in the sense of what you're going to run into with Pio Pico later on in class, uh, someone who really is grasping for themselves. So um, what I want to say here now is just that is as you're driving, all you Los Angelenos, is all you, when you're driving 101 out of Los Angeles into the San Fernando Valley, is you go through Cohinga Pass. And it's in Cohinga Pass that there was a, a, a um, Echendia, the next governor came in, the people didn't like him, and so Echendia and that governor have a little tiff. And in that tiff, they sign a sort of treaty among themselves and Echendia becomes governor again there at, uh, right at the Hollywood Bowl. You know, right near there, there's a, an agreement. That's the pass that takes you over from San Fernando Valley into Los Angeles. That's the, that's the route that everybody takes. And so in this sort of like Northern California struggle, uh, Echendia is uh, brought back as the, as the governor for 1832, 1833. So close off. Uh, just real quick, we are 
Republican Federalist system, Federalist meaning layers, we are, we are Roman Catholic and we're politically egalitarian, a very high idealism in all of this. And, and the fact that it's sort of Enlightenment Republican plus Roman Catholic is, is, it gives it a sort of really cool edge when you think about it. And then they've got some instabilities they've got to face up to and hard problems. But that's what all countries do. And Mexico is going to do something with California and has uh, this, as this document points out, there's a colonization, colonization plan and there's also um, plans for uh, eventually lots of pueblos, lots of pueblos. Uh, and there'd be lots of self-governance and lots of good things going on in California.